Harvey Lake Michigan Christian Center, I'm so glad you could join us for our online service. I've got a great word about closing the gaps in our lives. But before we get to that, I want to encourage you to reach out to friends, family members, everyone you know, send them a link to our online service so we can get as many people as possible watching our services every single week. All right, I'll see you on the other side of the meet and greet. Ten and a half years ago, I had the privilege of going to England to study at Oxford University as a part of an extension program with Regent University uh, as part of my graduate degree in government. And I loved England, and I loved London, and I loved the whole experience. It was just fun. Um, <laughs> suffice to say, the British people are a hoot. And I remember the first time I went on the um, <clears throat> excuse me the London subway system, um, all throughout the, the subway system, you would hear before you would get on the subway, mind the gap. And the first time I heard mind the gap, I'm like, what is that? What is mind the gap? You know, and of course, let's remember the British people originated the English language. So I guess they've got a little bit of a monopoly on its usage. And what I was to find out was that mind the gap was basically their way of saying there's a space between the walkway that you're on and the train that you're getting on. And so watch that space. Don't step into that because you could obviously get hurt. But they don't call it a space. They call it the gap. And mind is pay attention. So, <laughs> so mind the gap is pay attention to the space and don't trip on it or don't step on it, you're going to get hurt. And so I heard that all the time. And, and, and actually, I heard it so many times that probably like most Londoners, I started to ignore it because I'm like, okay, whatever. But, but, but that brings to mind uh, what I want to share with you this morning. And, and, and there's something that's been really special about the time of prayer, the week of prayer we had uh, a few weeks ago as we began the month of January. And um, as I was praying about what to pray about each night, uh, I really felt like the Lord really showed me some things this year in a way that he hasn't done in years past. And as I was praying about what to pray about, uh, one of the items that the Lord showed me <clears throat> was he, he gave me a, I don't want to use the word vision, but, but I, I, a picture of the people of God at Lake Michigan Christian Center. And I saw all kinds of gaps in people's lives. And, and it was kind of like this idea that people are dealing with struggles. Um, people are suffering attacks from the enemy. Um, people are stumbling needlessly over easily besetting sins. People are offended because there are gaps in their lives. There's gaps in their spiritual lives. I saw that very, very clearly. And probably the most powerful time of prayer we had during our week of prayer was the night that we prayed for the gaps. We prayed that God, would you please fill these gaps? Or if we'd say it in British vernacular, mind the gaps. And so I want to share just briefly about some practical ways that we as believers can make sure that we do not allow any gaps in our spiritual lives so that we, well, it'll help us to not suffer needlessly and to not stumble needlessly when there's some things that I believe we can put in place in our lives that'll be very, very helpful. So let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this time together in your word. And Father, I pray that you would quicken to our hearts everything you want us to receive as we talk about minding the gap this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you've got your Bibles, I encourage you to turn to Ezekiel, the 22nd chapter and verse 30. I'm going to share probably what should be a fairly familiar scripture. And basically, as Ezekiel the prophet was um, you know, praying for the people of Israel and preaching to the people of, of Israel and, and speaking to them as he was in exile himself, the Lord spoke this to him. I looked for someone who would might rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards the land. I search for someone to stand in the gap 
in the wall so I wouldn't have to destroy the land, but I found none. Now, as Ezekiel is getting this vision, um, Israel had not, the, the, the southern kingdom had not totally fallen yet. It, it had suffered a couple of invasions, but there were still, it was still in existence. In fact, Jeremiah the prophet was ministering at that time. So the specific word that God gave Ezekiel was this. I'm looking for someone that can basically stand for righteousness in this nation. Now, Jeremiah was there, and Jeremiah was certainly a righteous man. However, specifically, this is referring to a leader, a political leader that could actually stand up and stand for the nation. And, and if you know anything about the kings, after Josiah was king, they were, well, they were a bunch of spiritual knuckleheads, right? They, they, were, they were idolaters and perverse and just a, a wicked group of people. But, but let's, let's drill down on the main point that I really felt to share during the prayer time, and I'm sharing with you now is this idea that there are gaps, right? There's, there's, there's a wall of righteousness. Again, that is Jesus, obviously. We are clothed with Christ as New Testament believers. But there are times when we can get lazy. We can get sloppy. We can unwittingly let the enemy in. And so suddenly now gaps or breaches form in our spiritual lives, allowing the devil to get access. Okay, now again, I'm not giving the devil more credit than I should, but the Bible does say, you know, be on the alert because your devil, the devil prowls around um, like a roaring lion seeking someone that he might devour. So we got to be very careful in our lives. And again, uh, I really believe the Lord showed me just a picture of spiritual warfare that many Christians uh, in our fellowship deal with. And, um, and, and so I want to just minister on how some ways we can close some of the gaps in our lives. And again, the gaps that I'm talking about are personal gaps in our own lives, in our own hearts, in our own families. But also it's corporate gaps as a church, as a corporate body. And so let's, let's think of it in those two different dimensions as we prayerfully uh, before the Lord um, seek to, to close some of these gaps. Um, a scripture that may be helpful to you, it was helpful to me concerning this, was Nehemiah, the fourth chapter, verses six and seven. And if you know anything about the book of Nehemiah, it's all about rebuilding the wall, the, rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. And the reason why the rebuilding of the wall was successful is because God's people worked together. They weren't in isolation. They worked together together. To, to make sure that that physical wall was rebuilt. Now, we're talking about a spiritual wall, right? We're talking about spiritual warfare. We're talking about spiritual enemies. We're talking about maybe ways in which we've allowed the enemy to come in to attack us. Uh, but this is what Nehemiah 4, 6 through 7 says. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. And then it talks about the enemies of God in verse 7. They got very angry about that. But they said the gaps were being closed. All right. And so, so, so as we're thinking about closing the gaps, this is, has an individual application. But it also has a, a general application, a corporate application for us as a church family. So let's just talk about some areas where perhaps we need to be mindful concerning gaps. Okay. Here's one gap that all of us at, one, at some time or another deal with. And that's a gap in our communion with Jesus. And, you know, if you look at the, the example in Luke, the 10th chapter, verses, uh, verses 38 to, to 42, it's the familiar story of Jesus coming to um, the home of Mary and Martha, right? And Martha was busy serving, right? Doing all the things to, to help serve Jesus and to help Jesus and do whatever, whatever he could to make him feel uh, welcome in the home. But Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus receiving from him. And, you know, Martha gets upset. Hey, my sister is sitting at your feet. You know, you might want to, you know, send her to maybe, you know, help me like set the table or wash the dishes. And again, Jesus says something that we're mostly, we should be fairly familiar with. Jesus said this, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better and will not, and it will not be taken away from her. Okay, so again, what was the gap in Martha's life? Intimacy with Jesus, communion with Jesus, fellowship with Jesus, 
Does this teach us that hospitality and setting the table and preparing food and cleaning up after ourselves is a bad thing? No, it doesn't say that at all. What it's saying is that the concern to be a proper disciple, the concern to be intimate with Jesus should be something that should take priority in our lives. Let let me say it another way. How much needless frustration, fear, anger, anxiety, and so forth, depression, worry, how how much needless, uh, how many of those needless uh, negative emotions affect my life or affect your life? when we're not intimate with the Lord. Again, a scripture most of us should know, Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these other things shall be added unto us. In other words, there's a lot of times we're looking for peace. (laughs) We're looking for happiness. We're looking for fulfillment. We're looking for joy. We're looking for the absence of worry. But I tell you, if you set aside time and worship the Lord, if you set aside time to commune and pray, with the Lord, I'm telling you, there is a shielding that goes up over your heart and over your mind, and it protects you, and it provides, well, it fills in the gaps. I'm thinking of Isaiah 26, uh, what is it? I think it's verse 3. You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon you, because he trusts in you. That's filling in the gap. That's minding the gap. Right? And, and there's a number of these. I'm not going to share all of them because for, for the sake of time this morning. But how about maybe gaps in our church commitment and involvement? Right? What does it say in Hebrews 10, 24, and 25? Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. In other words, one of the ways that God... Uh, encourages us, helps us to be fruitful in our relationship with him, um, helps us to serve him better, is by being involved in the local church. And again, I don't have to belabor this point because it should be fairly obvious, but there are some Christians, hey, I go to church once every eight weeks, whether I need to or not. You know, I, they, they go to church so irregularly, you know, and, and then you see them struggling. You see them going through difficult situations and circumstances in their lives. And, and you're thinking, gosh, how much easier would their life be right now? How much easier would their situation be right now if they were in fellowship with other brothers and sisters? If they were under the ministry of the word? If they were in the corporate anointing in worship times? How much could God do in their lives? But they disconnect themselves from the fire. They disconnect themselves from that which can give them strength and encouragement and, and, and everything that they need. And, and, and that, that's a gap. I, I, you've heard me say this before, but I'm thinking of George Barna's book that came out about 10, 15 years ago called Revolution that basically said that there are tens of millions, not tens of thousands, tens of millions of Christians that have just totally disconnected from attending a local church. And how many of them have become easy pickings for the enemy to attack them, to get involved in sin and compromise? Again, I'm not negating legitimate reasons why someone perhaps left a church because of a significant abuse or a wound or something like that. But for the vast majority of Christians, it's not that. They've just suddenly checked out. And again, um, one of the the characteristics of the last days that Jesus talked about in, in, I believe it's Matthew's Gospel, is he said, because iniquity will abound, the love of most will grow cold. And one of the, the consequences of, of, of a cold love toward the Lord is also a corresponding cold love toward the Lord's people in the local church. And so, so, so if this applies to you, close the gap. Get involved in a local church. Be faithful week in and week out. Close that gap. So the enemy doesn't have, you know, access. How about this? How about gaps in our diligence and our energy in serving the Lord or in our energy in just spending time with the Lord every day or things like that? What does it say in Galatians 6 verse 9? Let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Right, And, and so, so to, this is to leaders, this is to a congregation, this is to all Christians. Don't give up, don't quit. 
Stay faithful in your walk with the Lord. Stay faithful in prayer. Stay faithful in the Word. Stay faithful in church attendance. Stay faithful serving in a ministry. Stay faithful giving your tithes and your offerings. Stay faithful supporting missionaries. Don't quit. Don't allow a gap in your diligence because you've got weary. Now, now let me be candid with you. I get weary. I get tired. There's sometimes it's hard for me to do ministry. Okay, just being candid with you. I'm just being real. But what does the scripture say? I'm thinking of, is it Isaiah 40? It says, right, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. So the scripture tells us when you're weak, he strengthens you. I'm thinking of, what is it, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul says, listen, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Why? Because God's grace is sufficient for you. His, his power is perfected in your weakness. So let the Lord strengthen you. Wait upon the Lord and you'll find strength in those gaps of energy, those gaps of passion, right? They'll be restored. Here's another one. How about gaps in our vigilance against the enemy? One of my favorite scriptures of all time is John chapter 14, verse 30. Here's what Jesus says, okay? This is shortly before his betrayal, before Judas and his crucifixion. He says to the disciples, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. So what Jesus revealed is there was no gap in his life. There was no access point for the enemy coming in and bringing temptation or exploiting him or leading him into sin. Now we know from the scriptures that Jesus never committed a sin. But he reveals something here that should be paramount in all of our lives as Christians because obviously we're not the Lord Jesus. <laughs> and we're subject to temptation in ways that he, you know, that, that you know, that, that we, we struggle as, as humans, right? What, what does the scripture say in 1 Corinthians 10, 13? No temptation is seized to accept that which is common to man. But God is faithful that he will provide a way of escape for you so you can stand up under it. And so Jesus is saying here, there's no access point for the enemy in my life. Enemy access denied. Well, that should be true of our own lives, right? So, so what does that mean practically? Hey, let's not be lazy in our internet surfing, right? Let's not be lazy in our use of social media. What are you looking at? What are you allowing into your eye gates? What are you allowing into your ears, right? Be very careful about these types of things, right? Being sloppy in our speech, right? Being inordinately sarcastic or snarky. You know, not building other people up, but always being sarcastic. Are those some things that, 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 that allow gaps in our lives? We, we suffer from needless relational friction because of our tongue and some of the things that we say or how we say what we say? Are there areas of temptation in our lives that are needless because we become sloppy or lazy in what we allow ourselves to watch? whether it's a TV or movie or internet or social media, or how about reckless indulgences? Okay, I'm not going to get legalistic here, but there are some activities, there are some things that Christians do and indulge in that come back to bite them because they find themselves giving over to the enemy. What does Ephesians 4.27 say? Give no place, no topos. That's where we get our word topography. In other words, give no piece of territory to the enemy. That's what Jesus was saying here, right? The enemy's come. He's coming, but he has no, 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 no place in my life. He has nothing in me to tempt me, okay? Mind the gap. And I could go on and on and on and talk about, you know, gaps in ministry and gaps in our discernment and maybe gaps in our community outreach as a church and maybe gaps in our love for the lost or gaps for other Christians. But, but you get the point. I can't undo what the Lord showed me. He showed me that there are some gaps in our church and the Lord wants them filled. And so there are some things that God will do, right? Uh, God, I love what one of the scriptures says. I, I can't remember the exact uh, scripture in the New Testament. It's one of Paul's epistles, but he's, I'm sorry, it's in Peter's epistle. He says, who through faith are shielded by God's power. There is a shielding that God shields us with as followers of Jesus. However, we can also give place to the enemy. 
whereas God's trying to shield us and we're yielding to wickedness or we're yielding to compromise or we're yielding to temptation in another area of our lives. And so we've got to make sure that we mind the gap, that we close the gap in our lives. And again, as I'm sharing this word, I'm sharing it to myself because I need to hear this as well. We're going to pray about this uh, on Sunday morning at our campus. For, but for those of you that are here online, we are so thankful that you're here. And I'd like to pray for you as I close this morning. Father God, I thank you that through the Holy Spirit, you've shown me that there are some gaps in our church, in the people of God. But Lord God, you don't just show us things like that to leave us in that condition, but God, you show that to us so that we can pray, so we can stand in the gap. And so God, I pray and ask for my brothers and sisters, God, if there's any gap in their lives, God, gaps in their communion and fellowship with you, gaps in their faithfulness to the local church, <clears throat> gaps in their um, vigilance in making sure that they're not allowing any area in their lives open or accessible to the enemy, God. If there's any gap, Father God, I'm asking and praying that they would be filled. I'm asking and praying that, Holy Spirit, you would bring conviction upon us, and God, you would bring us to a fresh place of surrender to you in that particular area, so that, God, there is no place for the devil in our lives, so that we can say, like Jesus, the evil one is calm, and he has no place in me. He has nothing in me. I pray that over your people and I pray a blessing upon all of us until we gather together next week. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Church, it was good to be with you. Let this be a word of encouragement and a challenge to you. Be open to minding the gap, closing the gaps in our lives so that we can live victorious lives before the Lord and in our community and throughout the world. I call you blessed. Until next week, take care.